Hello and welcome to the Cornish Radio Amateur Club series of instructional videos for the UK Radio Amateur Examinations. I'm Rick Hall, G4PGD, and today we're going to tackle syllabus item 2A1, which we've called Current, Voltage, Insulators and Conductors. So starting at foundation license level, we need to understand at a basic level that the flow of electrons is an electric current. As the syllabus uh, uses the keyword understand, it's useful to have some background. But here's a study tip for you. Don't get too bogged down in the detail of atomic structure of matter. Read the background, but make sure you know the facts mentioned in the syllabus, as this is what you will be tested on. If you want more detail, have a look at the video called Atoms, Electrons and Current, which is in the background series. About matter. Matter is composed of atoms. Each atom has a nucleus at its centre, and the nucleus has one or more protons, each of which has a positive charge. In its normal state, we simplistically imagine that for each proton there is a negatively charged electron orbiting the nucleus so rapidly that it forms a shell. This Sun and Planets conceptualization is known as the Rutherford atom, and it is a starting point for atomic theory. Happily, as HAMS, it can also be the end point because we only need a visualization of how electronic circuits work, not a deeper understanding of atomic physics. In this video series, we provide a slightly more detailed picture than is strictly required in order to answer some of the questions that the simplest picture leaves hanging. Although composed mainly of space, the electron shell or cloud is largely impenetrable so that atoms do not overlap except to share an electron from their outer shell with another element to form a compound. The representation of the atom in the graphic on the screen is nowhere near to scale. It is said that if the nucleus were represented by a grape at the centre of a running track, then the first dust-sized electrons would be found in a cloud orbiting in lane 1. Each element, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, carbon, etc., has its own distinct number of protons, which give it its unique qualities. The hydrogen atom has one proton and hence only one electron. Helium has two protons and two electrons, and so on. Solids like silicon and iron have many protons. Their electrons, however, do not just get added in one orbit, lane one as there is a strict maximum number of electrons that each shell will tolerate before bumping electrons up to the next shell, lanes 2, 3, etc. So each element ends up with a defined number of electrons in its outer shell. This determines if the element has free electrons or not. Free electrons can hop from atom to atom. The graphic on the screen depicts carbon, C, which has two electrons in its full-up inner shell and four electrons in its outer shell, which, because it is not full, is free to receive and pass on electrons from neighbouring atoms. This flow of electrons is an electric current. If an element has free electrons, it is a conductor of electricity, if the shell is occupied and the electrons are tightly bound to the nucleus so that no gaps exist for the temporary accommodation of free electrons from neighbouring atoms, it is an insulator. Conductors allow electrons to flow easily and insulators do not. In a gas or liquid, the nuclei, centre of the atom containing the protons, are free to move in solids, they are packed densely together and cannot move. If an element that has free electrons chemically combines with another element by sharing electrons in its outer shell, then the resulting compound may not have free electrons and thus be an insulator. So brass is not a compound but a mixture or alloy of elements, zinc and copper, and so it is a conductor because electrons are not chemically shared between the zinc and the copper atoms, but remain free. 
Copper and brass are good conductors. Plastics, rubber, glass and ceramic are insulators. Even substances that, in their purest form, are insulators sometimes require only the tiniest amount of impurity to free up electrons and thus become conductors. We use this to our advantage with substances like silicon, which is doped with an impurity, a dopant, to make it a semiconductor. Another example of this is water, which is invariably encountered as a good conductor because it is never encountered without some impurities. Water, being a mobile and very common conductor, causes significant safety issues if it compromises insulators. Beware wet insulators. When dealing with electricity, wet skin is particularly dangerous as it spreads the entry or exit point for the electrical current over a much wider area and provides a much more conductive or lower resistance contact, which is hazardous. Water is a conductor and can compromise insulators. Beware wet skin. These are safety points. The greater the flow of electrons hopping from atom to atom, the greater the electrical current. If approximately 6 to 4, followed by 19 zeros, electrons flows past a point in one second, then a current of 1 ampere is said to flow. The ampere is usually shortened to AMP and abbreviated A. This is a learning point. The unit of electrical current is the ampere, AMP, with unit abbreviation A. Electrons will not flow to form a current unless energy is present. Electromotive force is the electrical energy that is produced by a generator or a cell or other source that causes free electrons to move from one atom to another. A pedantic point here is that the use of the word force is historical as EMF is not really a force. A more accurate term might have been electromotive energy per unit charge, but for the purposes of the foundation license and for our purposes, EMF is just fine. If there is a surplus of electrons on one pole of a cell and a deficit on another, this will cause the electrons to move around a circuit. This surplus deficit we call the potential difference or electrical potential. It is measured in volts, abbreviated with a capital V. Movement of charge. We've seen how current is effectively the movement of a charge. It is tempting to think that the only charge movement is that of the electrons as they are mobile, whereas the protons within the nucleus are constrained, in a solid anyway. For the foundation exam, it's sufficient to remember that an electric current is the flow of electrons. But as we progress through to intermediate and full, and start to look at the inner workings of semiconductors, it's helpful to be able to switch between visualizing electron current flow and conventional current flow. In a solid, the atoms are not mobile. The nuclei containing the positive charged protons remain static, while the electrons hop from atom to atom. This means that the only true current flow in a solid is the electrons. However, if we consider that current flow is simply the transfer of charge from one location to another, we can see that as a negatively charged electron moves one way, a net positive charge caused by the absence of an electron moves in the opposite direction. This absence of an electron is called a hole and can be visualized as a gap in the atom's outer shell that is eager to receive an electron. This is shown in the animation where we can see that while the negative electrons, green, move anti-clockwise, a net positive charge or hole, red, moves clockwise. So you should appreciate that electric current is the flow of electrons from negative to positive, but for historical reasons, 
Benjamin Franklin circa 1750, we most often use conventional current flow, which we consider to be flowing from positive to negative. The quantity of charge carriers or electrons that travel around a circuit depends on the PD, potential difference, and resistance. The PD drives the electrons uh, around the circuit while resistance opposes this current flow. This is sometimes depicted in cartoon form, the graphic on the screen, in which Mr. Voltage is pushing the electrons around the circuit while Mr. Resistance tries to squeeze off their progress and in doing so becomes hot. The rate at which this heat energy is produced is known as power. The unit of electrical resistance is the ohm, abbreviated with the Greek uh, capital letter omega. Moving on to intermediate license level, we now appreciate that there are three fundamental quantities prevalent in electrical theory. A potential difference, volts, drives a current, amps, around a circuit, while resistance, ohms, opposes the current flow by converting electrical energy into heat energy, joules. And the rate at which this conversion takes place is the power in watts. Electronic circuits are constructed from components that manipulate and control these physical quantities. When components are manufactured, they are produced to provide a certain physical value, e.g. a 2 amp fuse or a 10 ohms resistor, and have a certain tolerance or level of accuracy. Two components may have the same nominal value, but their real-world values may differ. The component's accuracy will depend on its tolerance, which in turn will usually depend on price. For syllabus item 9C1, we will learn to identify the values and tolerances of components that are marked with colour bands or alphanumeric codes. If a resistor is marked as having a value of 100 ohms with a tolerance of 20%, then we must anticipate that its value may range from 80 ohms to 120 ohms. A resistor that has a measured value that is higher than a marked value will reduce the current flow more than expected. Capacitors and inductors also have tolerances and these are usually specified. If the component's encapsulation is large enough, the tolerance may be indicated on the component itself, as is the case for metal oxide resistors. Later, for syllabus item 2H1, at intermediate level, we start to look at tuned circuits and resonance, including uh, inductors and capacitors, and it will become clear that the resonant frequency of a tuned circuit depends on the precise value of the inductor and capacitor, and it's important to determine this when building such a circuit and not just rely on the marked value. Components have tolerances, and the true value of a component may not precisely agree with its marked value. Most conductive materials change specific resistance with changes in temperature. This is true for semiconductor materials such as silicon and germanium, which have a negative temperature coefficient, which means that their resistance decreases with temperature. Pure metals tend to have a positive temperature coefficient. Components with a positive temperature coefficient can be usefully combined with components with a negative temperature coefficient to cancel out the effects of temperature changes. The negative temperature coefficient of semiconductors leads to a phenomena known as thermal runaway, where the current through a device generates heat thereby reducing the resistance of the device causing more current to flow and hence more heat. If unchecked, thermal runaway can become a vicious circle leading to the destruction of the device. Moving on to full license level. At full license level, we use formulas to determine parameters such as time constant and resonant frequency. As we work through those formulas, 
we will also explore the effect of tolerances and mitigating actions that we can take to reduce the adverse effects. Later, as we use physical quantities to perform calculations, at full level we will examine the effect of component tolerances on the expected result. In the next video, 2B1, we will look at power equation and at full license level some more complex calculations involving power and series parallel circuits. So that concludes syllabus item 2A1, current voltage insulators and conductors. Thank you for watching.